All right, so welcome to Chemistry um, Science Paper 2 2020, the Physical Paper. So like with the distinction, the Science Paper 1 is mostly physics center, while Science Paper 2 is mostly chemistry centered. So in this type of an exam, we expect a full-blown array of our chemistry questions. So our target for today is we can at least manage to do the MCQ part, we can do about 10 questions because I have to explain a few things. Uh, after explaining a few things, uh, we can see how we can proceed from question 11 to question 20 in the next class. Uh, all right, so this will require a lot of concentration, so make sure you watch this video over and over again for further understanding. All right, so uh, question one looks like a heating curve because we are seeing a downward slope. If it was a cooling curve, we would have seen mm, oh sorry, uh, this this is a cooling curve uh, because the slope is going downwards. If it was a heating curve, we would have seen a graph like this. Where we start off from baseline zero and then we're starting to decrease temperature, uh, like, like, like so, until we reach this point where we have a change of state where it's completely in gaseous form. But if you see a downward slope where it's going like that, uh, it means uh, we are losing temperature. So we're going from an, um, a gaseous molecule towards a solid molecule. So you have to be able to distinguish on the diagram which one is a heating curve and which one is a freezing curve. So here we are losing temperature, so we're talking about a freezing curve here. So at this point here, and uh, our molecule here, they are saying it's molten, so it's in the liquid state. So we're not starting at gaseous state, but here we're starting at a liquid state. So if we were to read the question, it says a sample of pure compound. A sample of pure compound is heated until it is completely molten. So it's heated until it's completely molten, meaning it was in a solid state. Molten means it has been liquefied by heat. So a sample of a pure compound is heated until it is completely molten, and the compound is allowed to cool until it's completely solid again. The graph shows how the temperature of the compound changes with time. So we could expect from here it was in a, a molten state, which is the liquid state. As temperature is decreasing up until that point, we would start seeing uh, a, a slope there. Meaning from point O and P, we have got uh, semi molten, meaning it's uh, either a liquid and a solid. Then the slope, uh, as it's Sloping further down, it's completely uh, it's solid between uh, P and Q. So here, liquid, liquid and solid, then they are purely solid until all the molecules there are uh, completely solidified. So here, our answer will be between O and Okay, so if we look at question two, question two is actually a combination of two separation techniques, um, which I have to explain. So these separation techniques are used to separate a mixture of uh, heterogeneous, uh, a heterogeneous mixture, heterogeneous, a heterogeneous mixture. What I mean by a heterogeneous mixture is that the substance contains things that you can visibly see. So for example, a mixture of sand and water. If you put it in a, if you put sand and water in a beaker and vigorously shake, under the influence of gravity, so you're going to have a g-force there, under the influence of gravity, the uh, more dense sand particles are going to settle at the bottom and you're going to have water molecules clearly, a layer of water molecules at the top because uh, water is, 
is less dense than the sand particles. So this process where this heterogeneous mixture under the pool of gravity yeah. settles down is known as sedimentation. Sedimentation. And for you to collect your final um, separation uh, mixture, or for you to obtain your final product, you pour carefully there. So this process of pouring, just until the layer of water is completely gone, you pour out all the water. The act of pouring out the, the water so that you can remain with the uh, sun and water there. So the act of pouring is known as decantation, which is the separation technique that has been shown here. So our answer to this question is decantation. Okay, so question three, uh, which gas is not contained on a large scale by fraction distillation? So here, so this is just for revision purposes. So uh, here I was explaining, here I was explaining because uh, here the question says a sample of a pure compound is heated until it is completely molten. So I was able to explain the meaning of this word molten. So molten is when you have a solid. This solid, this solid has been heated. So if you heat a solid very much, it's going to look like a porridge of some sort, a porridge like liquid. So it, it, it's, it's, we say it's molten, it's a liquid. So something that is molten, they just mean that it's, uh, it was previously a solid, and then you heat it so much that it liquefies, so it becomes a liquid. So a sample of a pure compound is heated until it is completely molten, and the compound then allows to cool. So it's become, it's going from a molten state, which is a liquid state, then when you cool it, it's going to go back to solid. You cool it, it's going to go back to solid. So they are saying until it is completely molten, and then this same compound is allowed to cool until it's completely solid. So here we are, we are skipping the gaseous state. We're just going from a molten substance, which is liquefied, then we're turning it back into solid again. The graph uh, shows how the temperature of the compound uh, changes with time. So I gave uh, a difference between a heating curve and a cooling curve. So this one right here is a cooling curve because we're seeing a decrease in temperature. It's like putting something in the fridge. If you put water in the fridge, the temperature is going to continue going down until all that water turns into ice. So it's the, it's the same thing. First of all, there will be a point where you're only going to have the liquid in the fridge. And then when you check the fridge after maybe 30 minutes or so, you're going to find the water is a mixture of a liquid and a solid. Then afterwards, maybe after an hour, you're going to find that now the entire water has been turned into a solid. So it's the same thing with, uh, uh, with this question here. So if you can see from this graph here, this is um, a cooling curve. So imagine that you are in a, in a refrigerator and this point here is the molten liquid. So here it's molten, it's liquid. Then as the temperature keeps on decreasing, you're going to reach this state here where you have got two states coexisting, which is the solid state and the liquid state. And then finally, the temperature is going to drop so much that you only, uh, you're only going to find a solid existing. So within this region, the question says, which of the following shows points where the compound exists in both liquid and solid, which is the region OP? Uh, if we can continue to question two, I mentioned that uh, this question is a combination of two separation techniques. The first separation technique being sedimentation and the second separation technique being a decantation. So question two says that uh, the diagram below shows uh, one of the methods used to separate mixtures. 
and I did say that um, here we're separating a heterogeneous mixture. When I say heterogeneous mixture, I mean a mixture where you can visibly see um, the two substances in that solution. A good example of the heterogeneous mixture is uh, a mixture of sand and water. When you have sand and water, you can visibly tell that, all right, this mixture here contains sand and this water contains mixture. That's an example of the heterogeneous mixture. So the first thing that you do, you sediment this mixture. Under the natural pool of gravitational forces, the more dense sand particles are going to settle at the bottom, leaving, a, a, uh, leaving two layers. So you're going to have water there, and you're going to have your sand particles there. So two layers, because sand is more dense than water. So the act of pouring uh, the topmost layer into a separate beaker, that act of pouring carefully until you remain with just the sand in one beaker and water in another beaker, you are pouring carefully, it's known as decantation, which is the separation technique that they are showing on uh, this diagram there. So they are pouring out. So you are leaving the residue there and you are leaving the clear solvent there. So this was maybe an example of sand and water like I mentioned. So here the separation technique for question number two is a decantation. So let's read through question number three. So question number three says that uh, which gas is not obtained on a large scale by fractional distillation? So we did mention last time that fractional distillation is a separation technique uh, which utilizes the different boiling points of uh, different substances. And one of the major applications of the process of fractional distillation was uh, separating our various fractions of crude oil. But it's also important to note that air is also a mixture of gases. And all those mixtures of gases can be separated so a mixture of air can be separated into its various fractions, also by a fractional distillation. And nowadays, you can see one of the industrial applications, you can see among COVID patients, uh, they need oxygen. So that oxygen is actually separated uh, from the mixture of air using fractional distillation. But here among the multiple choices, that way they are not which gas is not obtained on a large scale by a fraction of distillation. So here we're just looking at the small gases, the components of air, but something as complex as ammonia. So here our answer is ammonia. We do not obtain ammonia using fraction of distillation. I'm sure we're going to encounter the process, but uh, the process that we use to obtain ammonia industrially is known as the Haber process. If we encounter a question, I'm going to explain what the Haber process is, but it has a lot of uh, redox reactions uh, taking place in, 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 the, in the separation chamber. So the answer there is ammonia. Argon, nitrogen, and oxygen are found in the atmosphere. Remember I said uh, air is a mixture of gases, so those you can obtain them by a fraction of distillation. But something as complex as ammonia, you need a much more sophisticated process to force that ammonia gas out. And that process is uh, the Haber process. We're going to explain further. Okay, so this question here is uh, it looks like another separation technique. And this separation technique is actually known as a sublimation. So if we were to read through the question here it says uh, a mixture of salt and iodide crystals remember in my notes i did mention that iodine is an example of a substance that sublimes but what is sublimation let me explain uh, what sublimation actually is sublimation so let me write it down here Sublimation. So uh, sublimation, by the way, it's, it's a physical change. So when we're talking about um, chemistry, you know, chemistry is just um, the study of uh, atoms and their interactions. 
and the types of reactions that, um, that occur at the subatomic level. And when we're talking about chemical reactions in nature, or when we're talking about reactions in the chemical world, we have got two types of reactions. You can have a chemical reaction, which is irreversible, and where a new substance is formed. A good example of the chemical reaction, you know, these people, I don't know whether in Chongwe or what have you, they usually get um, a carbon source from trees. They get trees, they chop them off, and then they bend them to make charcoal. So that charcoal is a new substance. And you can also get that charcoal and you know, uh, use it and you create ash. So that's an example of a chemical change where a new substance is formed. But other states of matter, other substances undergo physical changes. So a physical change is reversible and no new substance is formed. A good example of, a, of an element or a compound rather, that carries out a completely natural physical change is water. Every time water is uh, transitioning in all three states, either solid, liquid, and gas. If you look at the water molecules, the H2O molecules still remain H2O molecules. No wonder it's a physical change. So if I were to draw a simple molecular structure there, uh, this is H2O. So you are going to have, this is your central oxygen, and these two things there that I've drawn are your two hydrogen atoms. So this, this is one molecule of water. And they are held together by these bonds here. You can call them Van der Waals forces of attraction, or you can call them hydrogen bonds, uh, whichever. So these two things here. So this is so I've, I've drawn up four molecules of water. So when you cool water, it's going to solidify. So that's feeling of solidification. So these bonds here are going to tighten up. They are going to become stronger. But these water molecules are still the same. Uh, if you heat the ice, uh, if you heat the ice a little bit, these water molecules, the bonds between them, are going to stretch out just a little bit further to create something that is liquid. And then now, if you boil the water, these bonds are going to cut off, and it's going to turn into water vapor. So these bonds are going to cut off and it's going to turn into water vapor. But the water molecules themselves still remain water molecules. They are no new substance is formed. So that's what I mean when I say a physical change is a reversible change in which no new substance is formed. And what type of physical changes do we have using water as an example? So basically, uh, we can write down the three steps. If you want to know all the steps uh, that you can list, you just say solid, uh, liquid, and gas. Then you're saying if we're going from a, a solid to a liquid, uh, if we're going from uh, a solid to a liquid that is uh, melting, Then if we're going back from a liquid to a solid that is freezing or solidification, if we're going from liquid to gas, you're going from liquid to gas, that's evaporation. And if you are going from a gas back to a liquid, that is condensation. So please watch this video, condensation. Then there is a state that that um, skips the liquid state. That's known as sublimation. So when you are going directly from a gas to a liquid, or directly from a uh, sorry, directly from a gas to a solid, or straight from a solid to a gas, we are calling that sublimation. Sublimation. And we can use this separation technique, uh, sorry, we can use this physical change of sublimation as a separation technique. So here, 
we have got a mixture of salt. So because salt is thermally unstable, the salt molecules are going to remain on this evaporation disk here. So this evaporation disk, they're going to remain, uh, the salt molecules will remain. But because iodine is very unstable, the iodine molecules are going to sublime and they'll collect there. And once you remove this in uh, this panel there, you can collect your iodine molecules there. So your iodine molecules will be collected there by the side. And on this evaporation disk, you are just going to remain with your salt. So you use this process of sublimation to separate a mixture of salt and iodine. So remember, iodine is one of the examples of molecules that sublime. And what do you collect here? Because it's sublimation, you're going to call it the sublimate. And what you're going to left, what you're going to be left with on this evaporation disk is known as your residue. So here, our answer here is B, the sublimate, and S, the residue. So remember, please, another uh, good example of a substance that sublimes is dry ice. The dry ice is just uh, like a frozen carbon dioxide. So give an example of two substances that sublime, iodine and uh, dry ice. All right, so uh, what do we have? Uh, here, uh, what do we have here? So let's read, let's read out question five. Uh, it says graphite. Uh, are you with me, Fabi? You are with me? Yes. All right. Just uh, make sure you watch this video. I'm going to send it immediately after the class. I'll be upset if you don't watch this video. So watch this video, revise. Uh, read more books, find more, in, find even more YouTube videos to help you understand certain topics, practice. There are so many materials out there uh, available online for you to, to enhance your knowledge. So here we're uh, we now talking about allotropes in nature. So here they are saying graphite and diamonds are allotropes of carbon. So when we talk about allotropes, we're just talking about an alternative form in which um, the same compound can exist. So if you look at the molecular structure, it's, if you look at the molecular formula, they are exactly identical. Molecular formula, exactly identical. Molecular formula, how molecules are arranged. But when you look at the structural formula, it's a little bit different. So how the atoms are arranged now, or how the structures link together to form uh, a, a different structure, how those structures interact. So graphite and diamonds, every time you hear the word allotrope of any type of element, it's just an alternative form in which a compound can exist having an identical molecular formula, but it's the structure that's different. So I'm going to, uh, hopefully, I hope I remember the, the, the different structure of, of, of graphite and diamond. I think I remember, I'll be able to draw it. So which of the following statements below gives the correct meaning of the term allotropy? So, um, a, the existence of two or more atoms having the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So here, uh, if something has the same proton number, here we're talking about isotopes. So A is wrong. Uh, B, the existence of different forms of an element, but in the same physical state. So here, uh, they, are not, they are definitely not in the same physical state because diamond and carbon are completely different. Um, as states, they are very different. They are giant structures formed from a weak, uh, formed from a network of carbon atoms. So this is true that they are actually giant structures, but they have differences. So they are formed from a network, but this doesn't clearly explain the term allotropes. So our answer here will be D, which says, Compounds having the exact same molecular formula, but different structural formula. 
So if I am not mistaken, <clears throat> uh, graphite, uh, graphite is arranged in, um, is it a, a, a hexagonal arrangement? So hexa means uh, six-sided. So you're going to find maybe one, two, three, four, five, six. They are going to find uh, molecules arranged sort of like that, layers over each other. So another uh, hexagonal structure like that. So this is how graphite would look like. And here there are spaces there, there are spaces. So the molecules can sort of slide over each other. No wonder graphite can also be used uh, as a lubricant because the molecules can slide over one another. But uh, when we talk about uh, diamond, they are arranged in a tetrahedral sort of fashion. So they are sort of found in, I think, uh, a, a four molecular arrangements, which leaves no room, sort of leaves uh, no room. So I, I don't know, but something like that, a tetrahedral sort of, uh, sort of arrangement with uh, no room for the atoms to slide against one another. Therefore, diamond being uh, stronger than graphite, despite them being allotropes of one another. So that's the definition of an all allotrope. Please do not uh, mistaken it for an isotope. So isotopes, it's definition number one there. The proton number is exactly identical, but the number of neutrons is different. But when we're talking about allotropes, molecular formula wise, exactly the same, but it's the structure that is different. Okay, so let's look at uh, question number six. Question number six. Hmm. What's this question saying? So they are saying uh, the table below gives data about four substances. So we have got four substances. Uh, which substance has particles in an orderly uh, arrangement at room temperature? So which substance has particles in an orderly arrangement at room temperature? So what I like to, so room temperature here is 25 degrees Celsius. And what I like to do when I see a question like this, which has like melting point, at boiling point, I usually like to construct a simple number line. So this is uh, the negative side and that's the positive side. And we have got our threshold temperature here at 25 degrees Celsius. So if we look at this, for it to melt and for it to boil, it's, uh, it's going from negative 114 to uh, 80 degrees Celsius. So its boiling point here is 80 degrees Celsius. So this one here, its boiling point is, so it's very easy for it to melt at negative minus 114 degrees Celsius. And its boiling point is 80 degrees Celsius. So here, by the time uh, air reaches 114 degrees Celsius, it's already in liquid state. I mean, by the time it reaches a room temperature at 25 degrees Celsius, it would have, it would be in gas. No wonder they are saying disorderly arrangement. So particles in the gaseous state are in a disorderly arrangement. So actually A is correct. If you see B, its melting point is way beyond 25 degrees Celsius. It's at 120 degrees Celsius. So this substance is going to continue being solid until you heat it up to 120 degrees Celsius. That's when the molecules are going to get energetic enough for them to become liquid and then gas, therefore disorderly arrangement. Same with this one. For it to melt, for it to go from solid to liquid, you have to reach um, 100, 750 degrees Celsius. Imagine. That's when, it's all, that's when it's going to start melting. Waste, this one, 1,000, 
uh, 610. For you to even melt it, you have to reach these high temperatures. So the easiest one here is this one, the one with the lowest melting point, because by the time you just reach negative 114 degrees Celsius, it's already liquid. By the time you reach 25 degrees Celsius, it's already a gas, and the particles will already be in a disorderly arrangement. So our answer here is um, A, which is negative 114, a uh, vessel a boiling point of 80 degrees Celsius. Okay, what, uh, what does this question say? At which temperature does a concentrated a pressure solution of sodium chloride uh, begin to boil? Mm, this question is sort of unfair because it's like they want you to sodium chloride. It's like they want you to memorize the actual reading at which oh, my internet is starting at which um, temperature hmm, what's the principle behind this question hmm. I'm not so sure about this question uh, let, let me get back to you with this question I'm not so sure whether it requires you to memorize or, or to know the actual states. Yeah, let, let's put a star on this question, then I'll, I'll come back to this. Okay, so interesting. So let's do some more concept calculations here. I hope you bear with me when we're doing these more concept calculations. Don't get uh, that much lost. I'll solve it very slowly. So the question says, to determine uh, the concentration of an acid, so you want to determine the concentration of an acid, a Lena titrated hydrochloric acid against potassium hydroxide solution. So let's uh, give a diagram, a diagram representation. So every time you have a titration, you have something known as a burette. Maybe let me draw uh, downwards here so that I can leave uh, calculate, calculations. You have a sub, uh, an instrument known as a burette, which has a cutup opening like so. And in this burette there, it's usually calibrated. So it's, it's usually the meniscus of the acid. This is where you put your acid. So your acid goes in the burette. And there, the, the acid level, it, it's usually at, it usually started at zero. And then as you are going down, as you are going down, the numbers increase until the final volume, which is until you have a color change. That would be your volume, your endpoint of the titration. And there you are going to have some form of conical flask where you add your base and then you add a few drops of indicator. You add your indicator so that you can determine the endpoint of your titration. So you keep on adding um, acid a bit by bit, a bit by bit, a bit by bit until you see a color change. So once you see a color change here, you have to make sure you keep on swelling, you keep on uh, swelling this with your hand, like you know, you swell with your hand. Bit by bit, drop by drop, once you notice a color change, once you notice a color change, you close the tap. And then that will be your end point of your titration. So reading this question here, what do we have? Uh, this student, she has, 25 uh, cubic centimeters of 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter of potassium hydroxide. So this is the base. So what's in this conical flask here? What do we have in this conical flask? First of all, the volume of this conical flask, we have got potassium hydroxide. So potassium hydroxide 
potassium hydroxide, we have got 25.0 cubic uh, centimeters. So here, the volume in this conical flask is 25 cubic centimeters. And its concentration, how concentrated is this uh, base? The concentration is 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter. So this is what we have on the first part. We are just talking about what we have in this conical flask, the volume that we have uh, synonymously if you have uh, a cup of uh, you get a cup you add 25 cubic centimeters of uh, water and then you start adding sugar until you have a, a concentrated sugar solution of 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter so that's what we mean here in that cup we add 25 cubic centimeters of water and then we start adding sugar until we have a concentrated sugar solution of 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter. So it's the same thing now uh, with this one here. We get the cup, our cup is our conical flask. We add 25 cubic centimeters um, of sodium hydroxide and we bring it to a concentration of 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter. So that's what we have in our conical flask. So then she starts to titrate. So if she started titrating at 0 0.7 cubic decimeters and reached her end point at 36.2 cubic centimeters, uh, what is the concentration of the acid? So here now we have to, to subtract to see the, the end point of the titration, the actual volume of the acid would. So here, she started titrating at 0 0.7 cubic centimeters. And the end point where the indicator, so this is where the acid is, and it's hydrochloric acid, so HCl. So where the end point, where she saw a color change, it was at 36.2 cubic centimeters. So the volume of the acid that she used we have to subtract so that we see the volume of the acid that she used when she reached the end point. It would be 36.2 minus 0 0.7. So the volume of the acid is at 35.5 cubic centimeters. So that's what's happening here. So she was adding, she started at 0 0.7 cubic centimeters opening this car lid bit by bit, bit by bit, just she kept on opening it until the acid level reached here at 36.2. Then she noticed a color change. She noticed the color change and then she closed the tap. So now the question uh, is, given the volume of the acid that we've subtracted, 35.5 cubic centimeters, given um the volume of sodium hydroxide in the conical flask and the concentration what is the concentration of this acid in moles per cubic decimeter so let's write the balanced chemical equation to so that we can see what's happening we might need it we might not need it but i think we have enough information here but let's write the balanced chemical equation so we have um, hydrochloric acid plus potassium hydroxide. So this is an acid-base reaction. If an acid reacts with a base, we are going to have a salt and water being formed. So if, if you look at these things, if we ionize them like this, hydrogen Cl minus, potassium plus OH minus, this and this will combine together to form the water. And then you will see that this here will be our salt. And how do we write ionic um, equations? We start with the, with the cation, so it will be potassium chloride, and they are already balanced there. There is one uh, positive charge, one negative charge, so we're going to make potassium chloride 
plus water H2O, like so. And uh, is our equation balanced? We balance by inspection. We have got two, one hydrogen, one hydrogen, so two hydrogens on uh, the reactant side. This two here represents we have two hydrogens, so it's balanced. One oxygen, one oxygen is balanced. One potassium, one potassium balanced. One chlor chloride, one chloride, uh, it's balanced. And uh, we have to use this formula. Concentration uh, is equivalent to number of moles over volume of solution. Number of moles over volume of solution. And you can see here that the mole ratio of hydrochloric, uh, of hydrochloric acid and potassium hydroxide is one to one. Since the mole ratio here is one to one, the number of moles of hydrochloric acid will be exactly the same as the number of moles of potassium hydroxide. So the way we solve these equations, step one, you balance the chemical equation. Then step two, you convert uh, what you have here, we have concentration and volume. So we have to change concentration and volume into number of moles, and then use more ratios to know the number of moles of the unknown. And then using the number of moles of, after knowing the number of moles of the unknown, you just plug in into this formula and you are done. So our step one, we are balancing the chemical equation, it's balanced. Then step two, we look at what is known. What is known is on the potassium hydroxide side. So this part here is the known. What do we know about the known? We have concentration, 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter, and we also have volume in cubic centimeters. So we can convert the known to number of moles. That's the next step. And since we have volume and concentration, you just use this uh, formula that you have to memorize. Concentration is uh, the number of moles uh, over volume of solution. So if I cross multiply, I'm going to have number of moles is equal to concentration multiplied by the volume of the solution. So the concentration that we have here is 0 0.2, 0 0.2 moles per cubic uh, decimeter multiplied by the volume. So the volume, we have to have the same units. We can't have cubic decimeters and uh, cubic centimeters. So we have to divide by 1,000 to convert from cubic decimeters to cubic centimeters. So we're going to say multiplied by the volume, which is 25 over 1,000 cubic decimeters. So that's how you convert cubic centimeters to cubic uh, uh, decimeters. So you can see the decimeters and the decimeters, uh, the decimeters and the decimeters there we, we cancel. And the only unit that will remain there is moles. So let's solve this. First of all, you convert from cubic centimeters to cubic decimeters. So you say 25 divided by 1000, you're going to get 0 0.025 cubic decimeters, then you multiply it with the, uh, the concentration, which is 0 0.2, you are going to get 0 0.005 moles. So here we have got 0 0.005 moles of potassium hydroxide. So step one, you balance the equation. Step two, you get what is known and you convert it to number of moles. How did we do that? Concentration, number of moles over volume of solution. So now we know the number of moles of potassium hydroxide. If you look at the mole ratio between uh, hydrochloric acid and potassium hydroxide, they are the same. Therefore, even here we have got 0 0.005 moles of hydrochloric acid. So now that we know the, we now have all the information that we need 
find the actual concentration uh, of hydrochloric acid, you, we have the number of moles and we have the volume, which is 35.5 uh, cubic centimeters, which we obtained from subtracting because he started titrating at 0 0.7 cubic centimeters and stopped at 36.2. So if you subtract, let's just make sure, uh, 36.2 minus 0 0.7, you're going to end up with 35.5 cubic centimeters. Uh, cubic centimeters. Let's make it easier for us to work through. Let's divide it by 1,000 in advance. So divide that by 1,000, you are going to get 0 0.0355 cubic decimeters as the volume. So now they want concentration. We know the volume, we know the number of moles. So we just say concentration is number of moles over volume of solution. The number of moles is 0 0.005 and the concentration is 0 0.0355. So if we divide that, 0 0.005 divided by 0 0.0355, you are getting a concentration of 0 0.1408. You round it off, you are going to get 0 0.141 moles per cubic decimeter, which is here. So our answer is B. Trebi. Yes. You are still with me? Yes. This is why people hate chemistry. It's a multi step process. Chemistry, they want you to know how to solve equations, they want you to know how to balance equations, they want you to memorize formulas, they want you to know how to change subject of the formula, they want you to know how to do a titration, what's the end point of the titration. So, Watch this video as many times as you can. In our next chemistry class, if you want me to even explain uh, this question once more, I can explain it once more, but I have explained it in detail. So you just have what I want you to do. By the way, if you, if you know how to solve this question, you won't fail any question in terms of uh, volume calculations and titration calculations in chemistry. Even in paper two, it's going to come like this, but it, the chemical equation might be more complex. It will require you to balance. As long as you follow three steps, stoichiometry becomes easy. Step one, one will always be to balance the chemical equation. After you balance the chemical equation in that question, there will be something that is known that you can convert to number of moles. In our instance, we knew the volume of potassium hydroxide and the concentration of potassium hydroxide. That's enough information to convert that known thing into number of moles. After finding the number of moles, we just use more ratios to see how we can use those more ratios to find the number of moles of the unknown. For our question, the mole ratio was one to one. Therefore, the number of moles of potassium hydroxide is exactly the same as the number of moles of uh, hydrochloric acid. So it's a one to one ratio. So 0 0.005 moles potassium hydroxide, exactly the same as 0 0.005 moles of hydrochloric acid. We want to find concentration in moles per cubic decimeter. So everywhere where you see volume that's in cubic uh, centimeters, you divide it by a thousand so that you go from cubic centimeters to cubic decimeters. So there we had 0 0.0355 cubic decimeters. Then we just have one formula that we have to memorize or there are lots, but this is one formula when it comes to volume. So you say concentration, is number of moles over volume of solution. You clearly know the number of moles 0 0.005 because you determined it from the mole ratio and you were able to determine the volume by subtraction. 
So 0 0.005 divided by 0 0.0355, you'll get your concentration in moles per cubic decimeter. So that's how you solve this question. Just uh, revise, revise, keep on revising, and you'll be okay. Uh, let's solve the last two questions. Sorry for keeping you up to 18. We don't have uh, that much time. Don't worry, question nine looks simple. I hope question 10 is easy as well. After all that uh, mind blowing thing, let's look at question. All right, uh, question nine and 10, they are okay. All right, so the energy level profile uh, shows how adding substance X to a reaction mixture changes the reaction pathway. So the original reaction there, we had uh, reactants, and then our, uh, the, it goes like that. And then we have got products. So without this substance, X. After adding X, the reaction went like that, then it went like that, and then we had products. So here we are interested in this uh, part here. The distance from there to the distance from there to there. Actually, let me draw it properly. It's the distance from there to there to your product. Yeah. So that's the baseline. And the distance from there to there, your product. So I've drawn two distances. <laughs> there and there. So those two arrows there that have drawn, that's known as activation energy. So every reaction that you can think of has got activation energy. Activation energy is the energy that you have to overcome for the reaction to take place. So right now, someone is about to open the door just the act of them opening that door you need to apply a certain amount of energy to overcome the force uh, of the door right you have to open that door you have to apply a certain amount of energy to open that door so the energy that has to be overcome to open that door is synonymous with activation energy but imagine maybe you take an energy drink maybe you are hungry so without food, without food, you are hungry, you had a long day, you are starving and you reach up the door, you're not going to open that door with that much power. So without food, you won't open that door easily. It will be hard for you to open that door. But once you, you have food, you, you, you know, you eat, you have some food, you're going to have enough energy to easily open that door. So that's activation energy. So this is what uh, a catalytic process uh, uh, does. It reduces the rate of the chemical reaction. It's much faster if you add the catalyst. So a catalyst is going to reduce that activation energy so that the reaction can occur very quickly. So you can see here that we have got products and we have got uh, here, the activation energy for reaction one. Without the catalyst, the reaction rate is very slow. But with the catalyst here, the activation energy has gone down. The activation energy has gone down, meaning the reaction rate is much faster. So here it actually shows that the rate of reaction has increased and this substance X here, if you want to identify it, it's called a catalyst. See, catalyst, something like that. Okay, let's look at our final question. I haven't even switched on the line, I'm in the darkness. So when a solid uh, potassium chloride is added to water, 
the temperature of the liquid goes down. So which conclusion can be made? So here they, they just want you to distinguish between an exothermic reaction and an exothermic reaction. So a good example, if you bend something, that's combustion. If something bends, it's combustion. What happens? Heat is released into the environment. So heat release. That's exothermic, a reaction that releases heat in the environment. But let's say you add water in the fridge. What's happening? The, the fridge, uh, the water is starting to suck all that uh, uh, energy in. So energy is not released to the environment. Oh, sorry, energy is not lost into the environment. But the, all the energy is sort of, uh, energy is not being lost to the environment. It's sort of absorbing the energy. So that's known as uh, endothermic. So did I say exothermic, endothermic, endothermic? endothermic so no energy is released to the environment but all that energy is used for forming bonds to make that ice that liquid into a solid so think of endothermic as putting something in the fridge and think of exothermic as igniting something causing some form of explosion where you have a lot of energy that's been released to the environment so because when sodium, uh, when solid potassium chloride is added to water, the temperature goes low. So the temperature has reduced, much more like you put something in the fridge. The temperature hasn't increased, meaning this reaction is endothermic because no energy has been released to the environment. So this marks the first uh, 10 questions. Uh, when we proceed, we're going to do question 10 to 20. After doing question 10 to 20, we're going to go into section B. So these uh, questions be on the table. Blah, blah, blah. I'm sure there's always organic chemistry at the end. Okay. okay. Oh, this is qualitative chemistry. We're going to do this. Oh, there's no organic chemistry. It's more interesting. I, I think uh, organic chemistry is mostly found in pure sciences, but I'm sure there will, there will be multiple choice questions under organic chemistry. So we're going to finish this paper, the science paper 2 2020. And once we finish this paper, watch these videos as much as you can. Because of the time that we have and the amount of explaining that I have to do, we can only solve this paper. But in as much as we are solving only this paper, it will come exactly the same. This, the principles will always be the same. How to find the answer will always be the same. So as long as you understand this paper and you read, you know, you read further, practice further, watch some further YouTube videos here and there you'll be able to you know, write something in your examination. So let me pause this video, then I'm going to send you um, the video via email. All right, uh, see you tomorrow, uh, most likely for physics, for the dungeons. I know it was a lot of work, but just trust yourself, you can do this. Just go in the exam there, just study, do your utmost best. If it means studying for six hours a day, if it means studying 10, 12 hours a day, dividing that time into maybe you study for three hours, you rest a bit, then you find another time to study for three hours, you rest, then you find another three hours, do it. Do what you can. You can do this. I will see you tomorrow. Uh, bye.